first slide. Um, just a little bit about me. I have self-published, well, my name is Karen Bainey, first of all. I have self-published six novels in the last two years. Um, four of them are all part of one series, and then I get a compilation of all four books in my ebook, kind of bargain, uh, conscious of fire. And then I have one contemporary romance. Um, I've sold over 27,000 copies in that two-year time frame, about 20,000 of them this year alone. Um, I've reached number one bestseller status in religious fiction on Amazon for a couple weeks running. That was really cool. And I have yeah. screen grabs, but I thought it was a little too easy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also have a background in uh, business. Uh, I'm a software engineer by day and uh, author by night and entrepreneur by night. Um, my husband and I own a company called ChristianEbookToday.com. They kind of came out of my love of writing and uh, wanting to help promote other authors. Um, go ahead, next slide. So today I'm going to cover a little bit about the growth of self-publishing, cover some basic terminology, um, who's who of self-publishing, so what are the retailers that you need to know about and how you can go um, get involved with the different retailers, and then what are the roles and responsibilities of an indie or self-help author. I know a lot of people think that self-publishing is easy. It's not. Sorry to burst your bubble. But the truth is, even if you're traditionally published, these days, like you were mentioning here, that you have to go out and market your own work and all of that. The same is true with self -help. My theory is, if I'm going to do all the work, I want all the money. Yeah. So, um, some basic uh, stats here about the growth of self-publishing is over last year there were over 235 self-published books. 37% of that was e-books. And when I read that statistic, I was actually surprised because 90% of my sales are e-books. So I was kind of surprised that I had, I was kind of off from the market on that. Um, and then in May 2011, Amazon announced that the ebooks outsold their print copies. So ebooks are definitely the new generation, the next way to go. I actually brought, in case you guys have never seen, I have a note color that you can look at, and then also um, a Kindle Fire. Just please don't walk away with that. <laughs> so if you want to explore those a little bit, pass them around and make sure they end up with Jim in the end. Uh, next slide. Um, so some basic terminology when we're talking about self-publishing. One of the things that we talk about is POD, or print on demand. And what that is, is um, you, you go to a vendor to get print copies of your book made. Now, the old model is you used to have to order hundreds or thousands of copies of a print book in order to have any available, and that's a huge out-of-pocket cost. Well, nowadays, there's quite a few vendors out there that do print-on-demand. So basically, customer orders it from Amazon, they send a notification to create space, create space, prints it, and ships it, and they get it as fast as if it were sitting in a warehouse. So it's actually a great scenario for uh, the distributors as well as an author. You don't have to carry a lot of overhead. And the nice thing is, too, if you are going on a speaking engagement or something, you have you can order copies ahead of time, and then you can have some to sell, uh, usually at a lower price than if you were just buying them uh, strictly retail. Um, E-book, I hope you all know that's an electronic book, but just in case, when it's every day. Um, E-pub is technically the standard for um, e-books, it's used by iTunes, Barnes & Noble, Sony, Kobo, Diesel. These are all names we'll get into a little bit more later. Um, and then Amazon, kind of following the Apple tradition, they're special. And uh, they have their own proprietary format, which as an author, usually we're converting it to a .prc or a .mobi file to upload to Amazon. Names here, aren't there? More than just Amazon, which sometimes surprises people. But I will tell you, 80% of my sales are on Amazon. So they are very important. But there's a lot of other um, 
people out there. So, and they're, and they're coming in different categories. So, somebody like Smashwords or Book Baby, those are what are called um, ebook distributors. So, you can go on, create an account with them, upload your book, and then they'll ship it out to other retailers like Barnes and Noble. Um, Smashwords will do Barnes and Noble, Kobo, Diesel, Sony, a whole bunch of different retailers. They say they do Amazon, but they don't. <laughs> they have never settled a legal agreement to get that one straight. And Book Baby does the same thing. The big difference between Smashwords and Book Baby is their pricing model. Smashwords doesn't charge you anything up front, but they do charge you a royalty on the back end. So every book that sells, they take a cut off the top. So typically you get your uh, royalty with your retailer. So like say Amazon, they're going to take 30%, you get 70%. Well, if you have Smashwords sitting in the middle, Smashwords is going to take a percentage off of that 70% that you would get. But you're still farther ahead if you're self-publishing versus like a 10 or 12% royalty that you're getting from a good publisher. Book Baby's model is that they charge you a flat fee up front. So if you upload the EPUB version of your book, um, it's $99 for that book. That's all you pay. But then you get 100% of your share of the royalty. So um, they also have other pricing models where um, if you want them to do the file conversion, they charge you more. They also charge you like per picture in it, which I don't like because I like to put cute little things in my book little dividers, I can find one here, um, between my scenes and my fiction books. So I like these little dividers. So I have these sprinkled throughout my book. Well, they're going to charge me $10 for each of those, and there's about 50 in there. So I'm thinking, I would maybe do it if I was uploading just the EPUB at a flat $100. But, um, I'm confused about yeah. what they do for you. Both of them specialize in ebooks, not printing on grant. But if you're already with Amazon or Lulu, places where people go, what? Who is our, I don't understand what they're doing for you. Okay, so the number one thing they're doing is you can't get into Sony without going through one of them. So if you want to sell from the Sony e reader, you can't oh, do it unless okay. you go so through them. So they, however, Sony e reader. Okay. However, Amazon, you can go direct. Nook, you can go direct. Kobo, you can go direct. Not all of them can you go to direct, or sometimes it's more bother than it's worth, because yeah. you have to do all these file conversions. And unless you're tech savvy or you pay somebody to file, you know, format your file for you, then you know you're spending like all this kind of thing and stuff that you don't want to do. So both of them are ebook distributors. So there's so many ebook distributors. Okay. Yeah. And when we're talking about print on demand, we're talking Lulu, Lightning Source, Create Space. Mm -hmm. There's several others out there. They mostly focus on print copy, right? So I send them a file that has all the interior nicely laid out in design. I send them the cover that I got done through the designer. I upload the files. They send me a proof. I say it's OK. And then we upload it and we go. Um, now, Create Space will also ship your book to Amazon as an ebook if you want. But keep in mind, it's the printed version. And one of the key things that you have a difference between print and ebook is in an ebook, you're going to change the font size, give people changing how it looks on the, on the screen for them. Whereas with the print book, you want it to specifically look a certain way, right? You're trying to fit words nicely on the page. So it's a different format. That's why I don't like it when people, as a reader, I don't like it when I read something that was formatted for print and then shoved it in an ebook because it doesn't always look nice. So, so that's why I kind of stay away from the print on demand for doing the ebook side of it, but I do use them for the print copy. So as far as actual ebook retailers, we all know Amazon, right? And you can go to their website, and I'll have links a little bit later about that. Um, Diesel, Kobo, they're they're huge in Canada. So if you're trying to reach the Canadian market, you want to be on Kobo. That's where your community thing is. And the guy who um, 
who owns the parent company, his goal is to actually outpace Amazon. We'll see if he makes this, but it is worth your time to get on there. Nook, a lot of people say, oh, is Nook dying? Well, they still have a decent amount of market share. So to me, it's worth it, and you can go direct to them. Um, and the reason why I, I personally go direct to Amazon, Kobo, and Nook, and my number one reason for that is because I like getting paid, and I like getting paid fast. Yeah. So when you go through Smashwords and Book Baby, a lot of times they're waiting on reports from the retailers, which they get through some like automated feed process, and then they do their compilation of it. And then like you might see what your sales were three months after the fact. And then you might actually get paid before the end of the year if you're lucky. So um, I just got my quarterly payment for like July, I think, you know, on Smashwords, you know. Whereas Amazon, I'm only like a month or so behind. So that's nice. Um, Google Books, I haven't even gotten into this yet. Um, I think my next slide is the one with the stats. Yep, let's go to that. Until I saw this, and then I said, gee, I should be on Google Books. So in the US, yeah, Amazon's a big fish, no doubt about it. And by the way, these numbers, they kind of came from a presentation that Bowker Industries did back in March. And if you're not familiar with Bowker, they are the ones that basically run the ISBN system. So they're tracking everything. And so the interesting thing here is Amazon, my gut feeling was that Amazon had more of a market share than they do, but with iTunes and iBooks, Apple has almost 25% of the market in the US. Nook is about seven, Google five, Kobo two. When you expand out to a more international view, this includes um, the US, UK, Spain, France, South Korea, Japan, Germany. I think I got them all. It does not include Canada, which I was surprised. Um, but Google has about 23.6% here. Amazon's less than 20%. iBooks and iTunes is off the charts, and Kobo's still trying to get their feet wet. Uh, Nook just went to UK, I think, within the last week or so. And the other countries, what about the language translation? This is English speaking. All English? Mm -hmm. Would you English increase speaking versions? Would you increase your sales in some of those other countries if you actually converted? Um, I that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that one. So um, I know that this was this study was focused primarily on the English speaking versions or English versions of books. So. Uh, next slide. So as an indie author, I'm an indie and I'm proud of it. In case you didn't guess that already. Um, I want to talk about kind of what 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 does it mean to be an indie author? So you're you're a writer, you're an editor, a formatter, a designer, a publisher, a marketer. So you wear all these different hats. As a writer, um, it's important to do things to develop the craft of writing. You know, uh, one of the cool things about any authors, especially if you get involved with groups online, there's a huge support system out there for any authors. I mean, we've got each other's back. So if you want help with critiques or anything, find some groups online, join them. A lot of Facebook groups are popping up specifically for this. Um, for me, since I'm a working professional plus an author plus an entrepreneur, it's nice because I can just like a lunch break, say, hey, how's it going, you know, kind of stuff. So um, the, the important things about the writing aspect is that you have to write something that people want to read. You know, if you have an alien vampire story, sorry, <laughs> which is how my mind went right there. If you have an alien vampire story with a unicorn that's the hero, and you're like, who who are you marketing that to? It's it's a little too mixed up, maybe, um, or it might work for a great children's story. I don't know. Um, you have to know your target audience during the process of writing. This is something about the business side of writing that I think we sometimes miss 
as, as writers because we just want to write the story. It's awesome. And I have, a, I have a really good example from my own experience. My contemporary novel, Nichols, is about a woman software engineer. And it's, it's a romance. It's really what it is. But first draft of it, I was writing it, um, you know, the tension and the drama between the guy and the girl, and are they going to like each other? And then she decides she doesn't want anything to do with him. And then all of a sudden, I made a switch in the story, and I introduced this other guy. And then all of a sudden, how I wrote it, it was like a suspense novel. Like, <laughs> this guy's out to get her, and he's stalking her. And I'm like, no one is going to read it. <laughs> like, what was I thinking? So I took the second half of the book, dumped it, rewrote it, because I said it's not consistent with what my audience's expectation is. And I'm not saying that you write something that's repetitive or whatever, but when people pick up a, a book about a specific genre, there's certain things that they expect, and that's from the fiction side. But even from the nonfiction side, if you have a book about marketing, and you talk about marketing for like 10 pages, and then you talk about, I don't know, some sports thing or something else, you know, if you're not focused on what you're writing and meeting the expectation of the audience, your book's not going to sell. It might be an awesome book, but it's not going to sell. You also have to know you're playing genre during the process. Sometimes genre and target audience are the same. You know, young adult. That's it's kind of the same. You've got young adult, maybe a subgenre or whatever, um, or your horror, your vampire, your suspense. You know, those are genres. But who do you want to read it? Are you targeting men in their thirties? No. Are you targeting women? Because if maybe. you're targeting women, because my novel was sort of romance. Really? Oh, but, oh. So, vampire oh. romance. Imagine that's so original, right? <laughs> it's not Twilight, like. <laughs> no, it's not. It's not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, who you're writing to makes a difference. The language you use for young adults can be very different than if you're targeting a woman in her 40s. If you're targeting a woman in her 40s who is a stay-at-home mom, it might even be different than the verbiage or language or approach you use with a, a business. I don't know. So these are things to think about during the writing process. And I hate to burst your bubble. <laughs> Not everyone in the universe will want to read your book. Your mother might not even want to read your book. <laughs> Sorry. Um, it's just a reality. And so it's important to know who it is that you're trying to target during the writing process. Um, editing. Now, I don't know about you. I'm not the best editor of my own work. You know why? I know this story really well. I know all the things in my head that I forgot to write down in the story, or in the book, or in the blog post, or whatever it is, you know? And so I'm not going to catch that, because I know all of that other information that's in my head. So it's really important to have editors. Um, I know the temptation is, when you're self-publishing, to just do it all yourself. And there are some things that I strongly believe you should outsource. Um, editing is one. I outsource to two editors. I get them at a really cheap price, but they're pretty good. Um, and I'm thinking about adding a third, just because I like that extra set of eyes on on the book. And they're gonna. And it never fails to amaze me. I have two editors. They find completely different things. Uh, how is that possible? But it is. And you have things that have gone through tons of editing, still make it up with editorial mistakes. Um, don't freak out. Readers are going to find it. Yes? How much? <laughs> How much? I mean, you've got to be cost time. So yeah. most of the self-published authors don't think about that. So what should they be budgeting to have three editors look at a fully comic? I pay about $200 a novel. That's cheap. For all three of those editors? Mm -hmm. Not, not each, but around I spent too. Uh, I spent eight hundred, but she came yeah. out of like one of the it wasn't Scholastic, it was out of uh, Harper Collins. But you have people yeah. that you know you spend thousands of dollars, you can do it cheaper. Um, if you happen to have friends, I just have have to say this. I don't want to like scare the crap out of but I am an editor. <laughs> now I haven't done fiction a lot, I haven't done a lot of nonfiction, but you get thousands for doing a book, a nonfiction book. I mean, it takes a lot of time.
time and a lot of working with it, you know, it really, it really will. So, not, you know, just. So, so I think she's realistic it. because you, you know there's a difference between a copy editor who's going to fix your spelling and there's exactly. a difference between a copy editor and an editor who says, oh, your plot, is that you dropped the plot for it all this, or the right. character's not developed enough. That's so true. that's the more, you need somebody to write their English. It's actually called developmental editing. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. And you do, and you do get the different types. You know, we have the strictly copy editing, we're looking for grammar, punctuation, that kind of thing. I tend to send out to critique people for plot and structure kind of things um, in organization. So, and sometimes you get a good network of people and you get lucky, <laughs> you know? And that's that's why I can't emphasize enough. It's important to build relationships with an independent author because you never know. You might say, Karen, me, you said you get editing so cheap. Can you give me the name of your person, you know? Um, or, you know, do you think they would have time to look at my stuff? You start talking and you build a network and you can find things for, for less expense, but then sometimes you need to pay the money. And I've had some author friends who have spent thousands in editing still been terrible. So, you know, try to, whenever you're working with somebody, especially new, whether it's an editor or a designer, try to work something out where you're getting, you have some assurance that you're going to get what you paid for. And then if you don't, you don't have to pay them the full amount. No. One thing, when my wife's actually mentioned a few things before, and she said, look at this book here, it's in, it's in horrible shape. And what she'll end up doing is she'll quote two different prices. One of them says, well, I can, I can kind of correct a few things, kind of set you on the right path, and come, come, back, come back later. Or you can just go out and outright fix it. And that's a big difference in the prices. Yeah. So, you know, if, you, if you're confident that plot and structure is good, you've had some people review it, but you really need that grammar attention, you might be able to spend a little less money. You know? And the truth is that once you do publish it, if it sucks, it's not going to sell. And people will see. Now, that might not be the only reason why it doesn't sell. <laughs> OK. So you can't assume that because it doesn't sell, it sucks. But, um, but people will let you know if, if they think that it's not up to par. Well, since you were only paying $200, I'll bet yours is in good shape before you sent it in. I do. I I um I do really typically with a manuscript I leave it set for at least a month after I think it's done and then I go back and I always find stuff every single time I read through my books. Second edition, I still find stuff. Okay, you know, but it happens. It's a hundred thousand words, <laughs> you know, and you see stuff coming out of um, professional traditional publishing houses that have. As much stuff wrong, so it's I being on this side of it now. And when I was just a reader, I was like, I can't see they have mistakes. Now I'm like, yeah, I'm surprised that there's not more, <laughs> you know, because you try to do everything you can. Yeah. So as formatting, we talked a little bit about this before, but I do want to talk about you know what you how you format your book for um, print on demand. And and by the way, there's a lot of people out there that they just do formatting for you. So if you are not tech savvy, pick up my husband's card. <laughs> um, he does ebook formatting, and um, we'll just leave it at that. I know he doesn't like the print on demand stuff. It's not as much fun. But um, there's a couple things that you want to pay attention to. And I do have an article on my website, which, by the way, this big old QR code up here is so if you just want to scan it, you can go straight to my articles page. I have a lot of articles about pricing, self-publishing, marketing strategies for self-publishing. I have one specifically on formatting, you know, good standards for formatting your book. You know, one of the things that you'll notice that if you pick up any book, most of the time everything starts on this side, right? Mm -hmm. All the chapters start on this side. One of the big keys that it's not, that it is a self-published work is that's not the case. You'll see chapters started on this side. And so it's a big red flag sometimes. Now, I have seen other stuff that's come out of traditional publishers. My husband gave me a couple off of his shelf for the chapter started on this side. I don't personally like that. But um, having consistent fonts and not too many fonts. Now, with a, with a nonfiction book, sometimes you can get away with a little more 
um, font changes because you have different headers, maybe it's a one book style thing where you have questions and that kind of thing. But pretty much with your fiction, you should have Times New Roman, 10, 11, or 12 points, depending on how big you want it. But that's pretty much what the body of your book should be. And then you can do a little fancier heading. I have chapters and then I have a location and date on most of my chapters, but it's consistent throughout the book. For scene breaks, you want something. If you don't want to go to the expense of an image like this, you can do um, just three dashes or four dashes or something like that. Leave a little extra space. Um, page numbers, if you have blank pages in a book, you want to make sure that you don't have a page number, and this is the most annoying part <laughs> if you've ever had to do this, right, Jim? <laughs> That's the most frustrating part. Um, so you just want to make sure that everything looks nice. That's why when you do print on demand, I always recommend getting a proof copy. Create Space will let you proof it online. I still order that proof copy. To me, the you know five bucks plus five bucks shipping or whatever, ten dollars is totally worth it because I can flip through here, make sure it's right, pray I don't find any editing mistakes. <laughs> because it's always there. Well, um, it also helps you make sure that you've got your font size right and your margins exactly. right and everything else. It won't look quite the same on the PDF. You don't have to scale right. Exactly. And even though Create Space has a nice little viewer where they put it side by side so it looks like a book on mine, um, you still, it, it, it's, it's a known um, thing that marketers and stuff talk about. When you see visually on paper, you re respond to and interpret differently than what you see on the screen. So it does, it's a nice little extra check. Um, a couple other things. You always want to make sure you have your copyright page, your front matter. If you don't know what to put on there, just Google it. There's tons of stuff. Um, and then I always put about the author in the back of the book. And sometimes I'll do a sample chapter from the next book. It's a great free marketing, especially if you have a series or you're writing the same genre. This is your, this is your like, okay, you just finished it, like it, go buy the next one on Amazon. Um, so for ebooks, um, we talked a little bit earlier about EPUB is the standard. Um, there's different tools out there that you can use to format a document from Word to EPUB. There's um, Caliber is one of them. Um, there's uh, Scrivener, if you write in Scrivener, you can actually export it straight to EPUB. Um, and then with the Kindle, you can do, I don't know, can you do Kindle from Scrivener? I use it to yeah, things. Yeah, it, it makes it look Okay, so, and I, I use um, Mobi Pod Creator. That's just because that's what I first used. It's actually harder, I think, than Scrivener. So, but I'm a techie, so it works. Um, Smashwords, one of the terms you'll hear a lot with Smashwords is them, you grow under, Okay, what this is, is it's their um, software that when you upload your Word document, it takes it and it checks all these kind of things. It checks fonts, it checks, don't use the return to go to the next page. Okay, control enter or page break. That's how you get to the next page to start your chapter. Um, the meat grinder, it will yell at you for that. Um, it'll yell at you for font stuff. So there is kind of a process sometimes that goes through with the formatting um, on Smashwords. Or you can just hire someone. <laughs> um, audiobooks. There's, um, I, I think most of them are MP3 or MP4. Um, there's a website called acx.com. It is um, actually an affiliate of Amazon and Audible. And they have a really nice format. You can go out, you can say, I'm claiming my book, A Dream Unfolding. This is mine. I certify that it's mine and I have the rights to it. And then now I can upload a cover art for the audiobook. And then I can go look through their list of producers and narrators to find someone. I can post to get an audition so I can have people audition for the audiobooks. Um, they make the process very seamless, and it is a legal binding contract that they have kind of like 